Okay, so we'll open today's meeting um, at 4.33. I will um, read the meeting compliance statement. As chair of the Seabrook School Board, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12 pursuant to executive order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note there is no physical location or observe and listen. Can, hold on. Can't even read it with my glasses on. Contempor con contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that we are providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possibilities by video or electronic device. We are utilizing Zoom for this electronic meeting. All members of the Seabrook School board have the ability to communicate contemporary, I can't even say that word, contemporaneously during this meeting through this platform and the public has access to contemporaneously listen and if necessary participate in this meeting through dialing the following phone number, six four, oh, hold on, I lost it trying to blow it up and I keep losing it. 646-876-9923 and webinar ID 9218150-4829 or by clicking on the following website address listed on the agenda. Providing public notice of necessary information for Assessing the meeting, we previously gave notice to the public of the necessary information for assessing the meeting, including how to access meeting Zoom, using Zoom or telephonically. But instructions have also been provided on the website of the SAU21 office at www.sau21.org, providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body to during the meeting. If there are problems with access, if anybody has a problem, please call 603-926-8992 extension 103 or email revans at sau21.org. Adjourning the meeting, if the public is unable to access the meeting, in the event the public is unable to access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Let's start the meeting by taking a roll call vote attendance when each member states their presence. Please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. We will now take a roll call. Many public bodies are utilizing video, teleconference technology, such as Zoom to ensure the electronic meeting compliance with the right to know law and any applicable due process requirements. In certain circumstances, a regular business meeting of a public body may conduct utilizing audio only technologies. If you have any questions about the appropriateness of technology utilization to contact your meeting, please consult your agency Council or Attorney General's office. We can take the uh, roll call vote now. Okay. Forrest Carter. Jennifer Hubbard. Here with family. Jessica Brown. Here with family in and out. Kelly Huber. Here with family in and out. And Mike Rabideau. I have the roll call taken. Jess, you're muted. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how to switch over to my other screen. All right, 
I apologize. Okay. So let me see. Um, um, joint board meeting. Maybe on that right meeting. Hang on. Yeah, I'm on the wrong meeting. All right. Um, why don't we start with um, the principal reports? Um, who wants to go first? I think the next thing was public comment on the agenda. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to find the agenda. I'm on the wrong meeting. So I was trying to I just <laughs> move along. Yeah, we can help you through that. Okay. Um, so you have public comment at this point. Um, Rhonda, do you want to explain if there's anybody who wants to make a public comment, how they would do that? Sure. We do have five people in the audience. If any of those audience members want to make a public comment, you just need to raise your hand in the chat feature. Um, and then we will see that. I will open your mic up to allow you to speak or address the board. Um, at this time, I am not seeing anybody. Um, it looks like they're raising their hand. So I think we're all set. If anybody, you know, decides they do want to say something, just, you know, raise your hand in the Zoom, um, in, the, in the application and then we'll see it. So, okay. So I'm looking for our approval of the minutes for September 22nd. I'll make a motion that we approve those minutes. I'll second the motion. All those in favor? Are you, have to, a, you have to take a roll call, right? Right, right. Jennifer Hubbard? Yes. Uh, Jessica Brown? Yes. And Kelly Huber? Yes. I have that vote recorded. Thank you. Um, finance report, Matt. Good evening. Um, so attached, we, we have included the fiscal year to date um, expenditure report. Um, I'll just briefly review on that. There haven't been any real significant changes since last month, but I'll just briefly review um, some of the accounts that uh, we are over on. Um, so on page one, you'll see um, under regular education, salary certified staff were over budget by $25,000. Um, and this is due to the, um, if you recall earlier in the year, um, we had proposed um, adding a um, second grade teacher. Um, we also needed um, an ESOL um, teacher to service our students um, at, at, the, at the school. Um, so that reflects that those increases, um, as you recall, we did, um, we did plan to utilize um, savings in other accounts, uh, which you'll, you'll see um, there. We, we do have a number of accounts that have available balance. Um, moving down on page, both on, still on page one and page two, you'll see our special education department. Um, there's currently as a whole, we have you know, just over $18,000 available. Um, however, um, we do anticipate um, moving into um, the deficit on on special education, so that's a that's something that we are, um, you know, monitoring as we go through the school year. Uh, if if those costs do um, reach a certain point, then we would look at potentially utilizing the expendable trust. However, um, as being a bottom line budget, we do um, we we do want to you know look at the budget as a whole, and if if we're able to absorb it, um, in the in the in the budget, we'll we'll do so in that manner. Um, moving down, you'll see um, on page five under um, computer instruction, our new technology equipment is over budget by about twenty eight thousand um, dollars. Again, this this is one of um, the investments we made um, as part of. Um, COVID-19, um, that was for um, devices so that we could provide a device to, uh, or a laptop or, to all of our students. Um, continuing on, on page seven, 
um, under new furniture in buildings. We're over budget by twenty five thousand um, dollars. Again, this is this is actually um, just temporary. Um, this this reflects the um, locker project. Um, once we do get that withdrawal from the building maintenance extendable trust, um, that will go back to a positive balance. Um, and then you'll see, um, again, um, I referenced special education, but on page eight, um, the special education transportation is almost $80,000 over budget. Um, don't anticipate this um, going any further on over budget at this moment. However, it's something, of course, that we, um, we will monitor as we move through the year. Um, finally, I just wanna point out on page 10, um, we do have some savings recognized with health insurance, um, you know, just so about $110,000. Um, so that's, that works to our benefit. Um, you know, oftentimes when we go, when we budget, you know, we're basing it on current um, staff and the, the health plans that they currently are, have um, opted into. However, from year to year, we see staffing changes. Um, and that, that may mean, you know, going from a family plan to a single plan or um, vice versa. And in this case, we are recognizing a savings. Um, so I'd be happy to answer any other questions in regard to the expenditure report that you may have. So can I ask a couple of questions? Absolutely. Um, so you said that we were over um, because of having to park Chromebooks for our students due to COVID. So are we, how, how I mean, has the um, information been submitted for the CARE Act to be able to get reimbursed for that due to it being directly related to COVID? So we're, um, Seabrook received, um, I want to say just over $200,000. Yep. CARES um, funds, which we have uh, applied to our, you know, various accounts, and that that does include, um, you know, Chromebooks. Um, however, um, as well as you know other other um, needs throughout the school that were related to COVID. Um, but again, it's only about two hundred thousand um, dollars, which you know is isn't a, a substantial amount when you're looking at a fifteen million dollar budget. So. Matt, can I just add something, if you don't mind? Certainly. Um, so we do have um, a portion. I think most of that overage is going to be taken care of with the CARES funds to get the computers quickly so that we could get them in time because we knew everything was getting back ordered. We did order some out of the district and it'll get reimbursed by CARES. So Dan and I were just talking about doing that um, today. So I think we will see that number go down. Okay, so the 200, I think it was 205,000 Seabrook was was allotted for so does that so that 205 has not been exhausted then correct well we've earmarked all those funds yeah. but some of the so if we haven't actually expended a fund then it hasn't actually been technically used but we yep. have assigned those funds to um to a purpose um whether it's been spent at this moment in time um that's not that's not always the case for example the you know the chromebooks um you know we haven't applied that yet okay the, the reason why i asked that is because i thought that in a meeting in august um on august 11th we had a meeting and there was mention that um there was that the care act that we were not receiving that but um now i'm assuming that's probably for the ppe only correct well, that was for fema yeah so, um we're not receiving um fema, FEMA. funds so okay. Um, CARES Act funds were more for instructional expenditures. So, yep. for example, like the, the Chromebooks. Um, mm -hmm. FEMA was more, is more for um, uh, more disaster-related items, such as like supp cleaning supplies, PPE, right. those items. Mm -hmm. um, so th those funds were, were not receiving. Um, mm -hmm. and it would have been a, it's a, the FEMA funds were a lower price uh, cost regardless. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I do know at the state level, they are talking about um, potentially funding schools with some gopher funds. So that's right level. Um, so that I know it's early. I mean, they have, there's been no promises made. 
but they are preliminary um, discussions about providing some additional gopher funds and that would replace those missing FEMA funds or some of those FEMA funds. So that, that's something that we're, um, you know, we're obviously um, paying very close attention to and hopefully that comes through as well. Okay, yeah, because when I was listening to the governor the other day, there was questions about maybe bringing in, if by any chance, maybe, you know, having um, low staff in the future, maybe even after December, people were asking to the, uh, the governor whether or not substitute teachers would be covered under the CARE Act. And he did acknowledge that that was something that you could um, apply for. So that's why I was asking. The, the problem is those monies weren't sufficient to begin with. So the CARES monies across our districts weren't nearly enough. Mm -hmm. and, and there's been no reauthorization of a second source of federal funds, as you right. know. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're left with funds that weren't enough to begin with and continuing need. And, and, and it does not look like the feds are gonna step in and augment those dollars in any way, which leaves your local budgets to, to pick up these additional costs right now. We very much we very much have flexibility in how we use the CARES funds. It's yep. just there aren't enough. I mean, we we there there aren't enough, and we've already um, earmarked those funds for necessary expenditures. And frankly, since you brought up the governor and what he said, you know, the governor had additional funding, yep. additional CARES funds, of which I believe he's devoted zero to public schools. Right? He sent some to private schools. Right, we haven't seen any of it come to public schools, including a discussion that we had back in June, maybe earlier, with the commissioner about helping to pay for for some additional special education costs that were brought on by kids not getting services during the initial months, compensatory services they're called. We have yet to receive zero from this from the state to help us with those additional compensatory costs in our district. So. I hope the governor does have additional dollars that he's planning on devoting to public schools, but right now we haven't seen it. Any other questions for Matt? All right, we'll move along to the um, school reopening plan. So yeah, let me um, let me share if I can. Um, these are, these are a week or so old now, but I wanna talk about these uh, matrices that we've put out. And I've put up the elementary one here to share. Um, what we created, not out of whole cloth, but quite frankly, out of looking at what some other districts were, were doing, um, and we're reporting this more regularly, is a look at different factors and where we stand with respect to um, bringing students back. And so I want to talk about the architecture of this and then also talk a little bit about, um, about where we are now, because some of these things have started to change on us. So with, in terms of community spread level by town, we're taking a look at the state data. You can actually click on uh, this and get to the source that we're looking at. And where those numbers before were in a range in Seabrook that put us in the yellow range. Um, what we've seen across our SAU is that those numbers have been moving up. So uh, I think as of our most recent look, which was today, we're now at something like 17 active cases across our, our SAU, including maybe it was more than that because it was 11 in, in Hampton alone. Um, so I think the number was six or seven or something like that in Seabrook. So those numbers Clearly, as you've seen, the numbers start to move up at the state level. Those numbers are moving up in our community as well. Um, we looked at, we looked look at as a second characteristic, how has that impacted the school? And of course, Seabrook Elementary was in the yellow because we had just come off of dealing with a particular case in, that, that had directly impacted um, the school. Um, staff absenteeism and leaves, and you know from our discussions all throughout the summer, that, the, that Seabrook Elementary is a bit of a balancing act. We, we are probably at a number, given the numbers of kids who requested remote um, and given the number of staff who requested leaves that we can make it work and that we're making it work, but it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act at the elementary level. Um, availability of space, again, we're right up against it in some terms of some of those numbers um, in terms of what we can handle, too many more kids registering or, 
wanting to come back from remote and it might flip us over into not being able to accommodate um, all of those students. Um, and then we're also looking at student absenteeism, including re requests for remote learning. And, and again, that's working right now. And then compliance with protections. And the conversation I'd had with Stephanie when we put this together, we've not talked about it since, is that there were a, there were a substantial number of people who we were having to remind each day to fill out the app. And so, quite frankly, Seabrook Elementary is in the yellow with respect to, to those categories. Now, before I go to the middle school, let me just say what's changed are, as I said, those numbers of cases um, are up, um, are trending up, uh, number one. Number two, we're beginning to look at, like a number of other districts are, at the end of the first trimester and what happens with in terms of people's requests. Do some people want to go remote who've been in person? Do some people who've been remote want to come back to in person? Um, those those things could have could create some issues, and then a major issue that a number of districts are starting to deal with, including ours, is what about the travel restriction and the holidays? So we're starting to get information from staff, more so, quite frankly, from parents about potential travel at Thanksgiving or travel at Christmas outside of New England in some cases, which would put those families in a two-week quarantine when they return. And so what does that look like? It's one of the things that we're going to talk with principals about tomorrow. Um, so those are some things that may that may change. Let me find the other one, if I can. Ah. Middle school. OK, so I can go back to this now and go to share and get to this one. And again, this is somewhat similar, right? In that this is about community spread. Um, again, it's in the yellow, it was in the yellow at that time, still, still there, quite frankly, if we were filling this out today. Um, not cases that we'd heard of or been brought to our attention within the school community itself. So that was very much in the green. And you know from our discussions that staffing has been an issue in terms of the number of leave requests and those kinds of things, making it very difficult Therefore, the school would be in, in the red at this particular moment. Um, availability of space right now in the yellow because it's not something we've looked at as closely because of the staffing issue. Um, student absenteeism, inclu including requests for remote learning academy. We don't know. We have very old data on, in terms of the number of middle school students who might request remote learning academy and whether that number would accommodate students to return to in-person learning um, when we get to that point. Um, and then compliance with protections. When students are coming in, the good news is for their services, they're filling out the, the app and those kinds of things. So this is a commitment that we've made to do regularly. Um, as I said, we started to look at it again today in terms of the, um, the numbers uh, of cases uh, as that indicator, because we did see in New Hampshire the numbers within the last four or five days have increased across New Hampshire pretty dramatically. A um, couple days where they've been over 100 new cases. Um, and, and so we're watching that carefully and seeing how that impacts schools. It has had some impact on a couple of our, of our schools over the last um, few days. Um, nothing that's resulted in any kind of situation like we had at Seabrook Elementary in second grade, but a couple of um, what we've come to call close calls. Um, so, so um, that's what I wanted to say about, about, about that piece and what we're looking at. Quite frankly, this week we're spending a lot of time on what happens at the end of the first trimester and what happens in terms of the holidays. Um, those are going to be pretty significant issues for us over the next couple of weeks. Um, we, we, are, we talked today and we'll talk with principals tomorrow about doing some surveying of staff and of parents in terms of their plans um, with respect to those, those issues to see exactly where we are headed into um, Thanksgiving. So I'm happy to try to answer any questions and then we'll turn it over to Aaron and Stephanie who can talk about what's going on at the school level. Okay, Aaron, Stephanie, I don't know who wants to go first. I can go. Um, so not much much of an update since the last meeting. I think we kind of went over the structure that we have in place. Um, we have wherever possible two people 
in a classroom so that we have that uh, continuity for the students and we have kind of built in substitute situations and breaks. So one is doing recess duty while one's doing lunch duty. And so the students have those consistent people with them trying to maintain that cohort. Um, you know, I just continue to thank all my staff and uh, administrators and, and the parents and students for making it all work. Um, I think definitely, as Bill alluded to, we still have um, students and families that we have to remind to do the screening tool. Um, and that's a challenge every morning. Luckily, we have the middle school nurse helping out every morning. So thank you to Aaron for sharing Jordan. And Jordan and Mary are kind of tag teaming that first thing in the morning, reaching out to families that haven't done the screening tool or did it and um, noted and checked off that they could not attend and they're following up to check on those situations. I'd say the other piece of that challenge is any student who has a symptom that could be COVID related, we're asking them to stay out for 10 days or go get a test. And we've gotten a lot of, I won't say a lot, but we've gotten some pushback um, from families on that, reasonably so. It's, you know, really unique situation and, and uh, you know, it's a crunch for families to figure out what to do in that situation. It impacts people's work, but We've been trying to work with them as much as possible. And um, also, if we know that a student is going to be out for that extended time, our teachers are doing a great job of providing as much academics as they can. So thank you to all of you for supporting some of our self-paced online subscriptions because that really helps. So our students have reading and writing programs that they can do um, whenever possible and self-guided and brings them up to whatever level they're at. So that's been very helpful and our teachers have done a great job making sure parents know how to use the devices at home and are able to connect students if they are out for any extended period of time. Um, but we've been in school for 25 days. So I think that's a celebration. Um, you know, we've been doing well and kids are in great routines, um, very compliant with the PPE. Uh, parents drop off, pick up, all of that has been going great. Um, a special thank you to our remote staff too, because um, there's, you know, uniqueness in that in that role and getting things up and going. So again, thank you to Dave and Cindy for getting that up and going and uh, for all the teachers making that shift and, and making our work for our students. Um, we're still trying to get outside as much as possible. So our UA teachers have been fabulous on trying to get the kids out for almost every, you know, um, music, um, PE class, computer class. They're trying to do as much outside as possible so that they can have that direct interaction with the students and avoiding it, having to zoom into the classrooms, but they are prepared to do that when need be. And uh, the Chromebooks are going back and forth each day and that's going well. Uh, families are, the teachers have been doing little projects so that families are getting used to some of the different aspects of the devices and the different programs we're using so that um, they are familiar with all that. We have our SEL, social emotional learning uh, consultants working with us and we've been doing a lot of social emotional learning curriculum. Um, and Janine Richards, our new school counselor, and Mark Dangora have been heading that up to really um, make sure that we're tackling the, the needs um, where students have been out for so long and, you know, it's unique circumstances. So uh, we've had nice supports around that. And right now we're get, working on our shift to power school for report cards. So we're going to be working with the teachers on that tomorrow during our early release and some more of our social emotional learning. Any questions? All right, take it away, Erin. All right, thank you. Uh, at the middle school, not much has changed instructionally. The teachers are continuing to work hard and try to keep students engaged and have done a nice job of getting to know students. Um, We're focusing a lot now on a, a new grading system using competencies and um, teachers are have been using PowerSchool but are using PowerSchool in a little bit of a different way and really embracing that and asking questions and, and working really hard with Lauren DeConstant, our curriculum coordinator, on making sure that that's working well. Um, we are having a parent night on Thursday at 6.30 via Zoom to talk about grading and competencies and what that's all about and what that looks like and also just even 
as simple as how to access the grades in PowerSchool, where, where do I see exactly what my students' grades are and, and what the competency grades are. So that um, will hopefully be a helpful night for parents. Um, again, that's through Zoom, and I sent the link out in my communication. I'll also email the Zoom link out through, just through email tomorrow so that families have easy access to that. And Lauren's put together a nice PowerPoint to highlight that and we'll be able to record that meeting and also send that PowerPoint out to families who have questions because this is new for um, families for sure and understanding competencies can be tough and, and we've done some information to the board along the way and we've been sending out information to families as well but um, when the rubber hits the road and you actually start doing that grading sometimes it can be confusing so we're doing our best to give as much communication about it as we can in my weekly communication we've been adding little bits dave had done a great um letter out first and then lauren did some more information and we're just trying to give little tidbits for families so that they can access that as easy as possible i highly recommend that that families are getting onto power school and using it um, so that they can see the students grades and and they can drill down to see exactly where kids are at in specific skills. Um, also, some parents have said this, the schedule can be a little bit confusing because we're doing an A day, B day, and sometimes it's hard to remember what is, you know, which classes does my student have today and which classes tomorrow. So we've been really focusing on use Power School because the schedule's right in Power School. So um, if anyone should shout out to any of you that they're confused suggest that they get onto power school we're really wanting all of our families to to create that parent portal we still have a lot of families that haven't created an account yet so um, that is my high recommendation is that everybody gets on and uses power school because it's a great tool um, emails too I'm sending out lots of emails every week I send out my communication and any other important information is going out via email so if families are saying they're not getting any communication Perhaps we don't have their email and they could just call the school and we'd be happy to add that email because we're wanting everyone to get as much communication as possible. Um, we will be having parent conferences. That is next week on Wednesday and Thursday, the 21st and 22nd from three to six. And then we have added some additional time. They'll be doing conferences also on the 28th from 12 to three. And some teams have had to go even beyond that because we've had a great turnout of parents wanting conferences, which is great. And those conferences are all via Zoom. Um, so everybody should have received that information as well. And we're looking forward to being able to talk to families. They're very quick conferences in order to get all of our families in because each grade level has about 80 families. Um, but they're really gonna focus on how the students are doing with remote learning, how their how they're, um, just overall social emotional learning is going and, and just how they've adapted. Um, it will be not necessarily as subject specific because there's not enough time to go through everything. So parents can certainly email teachers with specific questions. And then just one other note is that um, because of the way we've done our schedules, the Unified Arts team are attached to one grade level for a quarter of the year and, and our grading is on trimesters, but the Unified Arts are rotating on the quarters. So we're coming almost to the end of the first quarter. So, um, and again, I'll, I'll put this in my communication, but students can expect to change the Unified Arts their class at the beginning of November. Um, so I just wanted to make a note of that, that they will be rotating through a little bit different than our grading period, but with the four Unified Arts teachers, they'll, they'll be rotating to the next grade level. I think that's all I had, if anyone has any questions. Okay. So next we have um, to accept a donation um, from Wayne and Jacqueline McKenzie for $650 um, to be used toward um, the outstanding balances for kids school lunches. Just looking for a um, motion to accept. I'll make that motion. I'll second the motion. Roll call. Jennifer Hubbard? Yes. Jessica Brown? Yes. And Kelly Huber? Yes. I have that vote recorded. And Jessica, it looks like there was an item that was skipped that was actually before that donation. November school board meeting. November board meeting. Yes. Yeah, so um, let me explain to you what we've proposed here on November. Um, so we're proposing um, in-person board meetings. We've been looking to try to do this for some time, but the issue has been 
that what we need to provide in terms of, of social distancing for all of you, the ability for us to have um, people attend the meeting is very difficult to do in five different places. This, the potential solution that we've come up with is to have all of our board meetings in November at the high school on their appointed day um, and essentially appointed time. We would use the auditorium. We would have the board on the stage appropriately socially distanced. We would have the ability for people to attend. We would have microphones for public comment. We would have the ability for people to call in with public comment and we would have the ability for people to live stream all of our meetings between the Seabrook meeting, for example, and the Hampton Falls meeting, which would occur is occurring tonight after this and would occur after this, we would have the auditorium cleaned um, so that we could have that second meeting. meeting. What we need um, from you in order to make that happen, if you so choose to make that happen, um, is a unanimous vote to suspend your regular policy on regular board meetings. So to suspend policy DEA. And the reason I say unanimous is in all of these policies, it talks about how, how soon it's introduced beforehand. We just think it's safest that we have a unanimous vote of those present at the meeting. So the request or the option for you is to suspend policy DEA um, for you to vote to do that. And, and that would therefore allow us to have an in-person board meeting at the high school at your appointed time in November. Looking for a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. Roll call. Jessica Brown. Yes. Kelly Huber. Yes. And Jennifer Hubbard. Yes. I have that vote recorded. Thank you. And Jessica, we do not have need of a non-public session tonight. We have no items um, for that. Okay. So we'll just um, go over um, next meeting dates. Um, SAU Joint Board, Tuesday, October 20th at 6. Um, SAU 21 Joint Board Policy Committee, Wednesday, November 4th. 2020 at 4.30. Uh, SAU 21 Joint Board Public Hearing and Meeting Monday, November 9th at 6 p.m. Seabrook School Board Regular Meeting Tuesday, November 10th at 4.30. Seabrook School Board Budget Review Tuesday, November 17th at 4.30. Um, and we have nothing for non-public. Um, so I guess now just looking for a motion to adjourn if there's nothing further. I'll make a motion. We adjourn meeting. I'll second. Roll call. Kelly Huber. Yes. Jennifer Hubbard. Yes. And Jessica Brown. Yes. All right, I have the vote recorded and the meeting adjourned at 5.11 p.m. Thank you, have a good Thank night. Thank you. Thanks.